and is uh, to forgive us as we uh, try to get the logistics uh, right for this here on our on our first try. So I direct the computational health informatics program. We're a 29-year-old program founded in 1994, a multidisciplinary research and education program. You can learn more about us at www.chip.org. And next slide. And um, the landmark ideas in the Intelligent Health Lab series uh, are um, uh, features that we offer here, and we hope to see you um, at future um, talks as well. And we'll go through what some upcoming events are at the end. Next slide. And really, you can put your questions in the Q and A box uh, as we go, and uh, we'll look for we'll look for them there. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our guest speaker, Hoi Fung, and uh, we're really thrilled to. Uh, hear from him. So you can put your questions in as we go. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Ken, uh, for having me. Uh, let me try to share the screen. Um, can everybody see the screen? Okay. Uh, I have to say that a couple months ago, I was at Stanford. I was also their first in-person speaker, and we have a lot more trouble in with the AV. <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, so, um, but just to echo what Ken mentioned. It's so great to be uh, 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 kind of in person and um, and see a lot of familiar faces. Um, so, I would love to share some of our kind of journey in. Uh, uh, sort of really over a decade journey in exploring how we can, you know, advance AI to help precision uh, health. Uh, now, obviously, like in the past, uh, uh, suffice to say, in the past few months, right? So there has been uh, uh, a lot of changes, right? Uh, and uh, I have been working on NLP for close to two decades, and there has been actually uh, we just discussed a, a little bit before the talk uh, about how uh, there has been uh, almost like this kind of nice stage of grief, right? <laughs> Initially to figure out, uh, is this thing real? Is it really that amazing? And so forth, right? Uh, to the point that actually uh, realized that this is such a great opportunity, right? Like really something that I have never seen in the past, you know, uh, close to the decades. And we have such a powerful tool at our hand and now the question is like, can we mobilize it to use it, to harness it, to actually help advance, uh, uh, um, you know, precision help, right? And um, and for those uh, many folks that ask me, how are we feeling at Microsoft? I can tell you it's a little bit overwhelmed, right? So even at Microsoft, it's very hard for us to keep track of. Like it feels like every other week there is a new copilot, right? Um, and a bunch of our amazing colleagues uh, have actually sort of enjoy the front row seat uh, uh, with this amazing model GPT-4, right? So, and I'm sure you can, you guys should be very familiar with the book by uh, Peter, uh, uh, Kerry and Zach, right? So, um, so it's really, suffice to say, it's really, really exciting time. And so what I'm trying to go a little bit deeper in this talk is try to kind of go a little bit, dive a little bit deeper into a technical front, right? So, so really kind of echoing the thesis by Peter's uh, book, but really also kind of go under the hood to see like, what are some of the great opportunities? Where are the low hanging fruit? Where are the potential moonshot application? And what's our roadmap to get there, right? So one thing for certain is that uh, AI, even with the latest powerful one is not a panacea, right? Just echoing again our discussion earlier. Um, but it's very, very powerful. On the other hand, uh, obviously there is so many caveats, right? Like the top of mind, like accuracy, safety, how do we use it responsibly and all that. So, so uh, it's a super exciting time for research uh, um, and application. So, um, so before we dive deep into, uh, by the way, uh, I would really love this to be as interactive as possible. So feel free to interrupt me if any question and comment. I would, uh, there were so many exciting things I want to share, so I would go relatively fast, but feel free to stop me anytime when uh, you, you want, you want uh, more elaborate, uh, uh, you have more questions. Um, and also someone, if someone can monitor the chat uh, uh, QA, that, that would be great. Um, so I want to sort of start by 
um, cab with a concrete use case where uh, some of this uh, amazing disruption can already potentially make uh, immediate life or death differences, right? So, uh, and as many of you know, uh, uh, in cancer, standard of care still, you know, relatively, you know, uh, uh, not uh, desirable, suffice to say, right? And many times it doesn't work and clinical trial will be your last one, right? So here is uh, Marty Tenenbaum, uh, who is a quite accomplished AI researcher and e-commerce entrepreneur. Uh, but at the peak of his career, uh, unfortunately, he got diagnosed with terminal melanoma. Right, so normally that would be the end of the sad story, but uh, he has a lot of resource and he mobilized his network to find a matching trial that actually saved his life. Right, um, so actually he remained active even to this day. Right, actually ten years ago I first met him. Uh, his story became very inspiring for me to actually uh, work, start working in cancer and precision health. Right, and Marty's uh, basically completely pivoted his career. Right after this experience, to basically try to help cancer patients because he correctly recognized that most patients don't have the privilege that he has, right, um, to to actually uh, uh, find the matching trial or or other uh, other quality healthcare, right. So now, how can we really democratize high quality healthcare, right? So obviously, the dream is to have a data driven, continuous learning health system, right. Uh, I mean, you guys actually know way better than I do, right. Um, and the National Academy of Medicine actually have 15 books actually talk about just this key goal, right? Um, but the reality is a little bit depressing, right? Because, and and one of the, uh, seems like one of the recurring theme over and over that uh, at least I personally have encountered with my collaborators and a lot of the people who educate me about this space, right? Like Ken and Zach and others, right? Is that there is just overwhelming amount of unstructured data in the health system, right? So, and right now, how do we combat that? We basically try to hire a human expert to do it, um, but that's actually, is very hard to scale, right? So again, I'm preaching a choir because a lot of amazing NLP and AI work have been done here, right? So you guys are super familiar with this uh, bottleneck. And when we look at the clinical trial space, for example, right, uh, in cancer, right? Uh, less than 3% of patients were able to find a matching trial. But on the other hand, a big part of the trial failure simply because they couldn't find a patient, right? Um, and when you look at the discovery, it's excruciatingly slow, right? You talk to any uh, drug developers and so forth, right? It takes you know, billions of dollars and over a decade to do it, right? So one thing that it feels so tantalizing this day is that we now have such a very super powerful tool and, and in particular, there is one superpower, which I would call universal structuring capability, right? Which is that it can potentially help you scale uh, dealing with all those unstructured data, right? And, and this can be likened to actually what we have been witnessing in the general domain, right? So um, there has conversation of general knowledge in the web, right? Which is actually what makes possible to portray this uh, very large length model, which start revolutionizing the general software category, right? So now you, when you look at biomedicine, right, there has also been amazing digitization happening in the past couple of decades, right? So you get, you know, omics, right, like sequencing technology, uh, electronic medical records, uh, health sensor, again, you guys know way better than I do, right? And now imagine for a second, if we can unleash the full power of LMs, right, on this uh, 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 kind of data, we can also attain sort of a similarly amazing transformation help, right? So, so that's very exciting. And at Microsoft, we are kind of a little bit privileged to uh, be among the first uh, and and to uh, to start exploring uh, LM in health, right? So, um, and we are very excited to see a lot of uh, kind of progress uh, over the years. And many people ask us about, you know, PubMember and about GBT, but now I would tell them, forget about them, right? Go to GBT4, right? And because this one is just having amazing power that really subsume everything we have in the past. And now with this tool in your hand, right? Uh, it can really start to do some amazing thing to accelerate the progress, right? Now to basically ground it in, for example, clinical trial matching, right? Um, I'm sure many of you are already super familiar with this, right? So here is a trial, right? The eligibility criteria. 
Um, obviously, there is a lot of text to powers and so forth. But amazingly, like um, you actually give a pretty natural description to LM, right? To GPT-4, um, it can actually uh, already parse uh, some of this uh, very complex matching logic out of the box, right? So I've been uh, sharing a little bit before the session that um, we always have a honeymoon period with GPT-4 in our first week when we try on some new task, right? So my team literally scream at me, like, you have to see this example, right? Um, and so out of the box, it already have pretty amazing uh, uh, kind of capability, but the second week you start to realize, okay, uh, there is still a lot of problems, right? You put it on stress test, uh, you throw all 300,000 uh, trial from cd.gov to, to GPT-4, it broke down in all kinds of different ways, right? So here is one uh, study we just uh, uh, in submission recently, um, but the high level point is that it's still far from perfect, right? But it's much, much more uh, powerful than anything in the past uh, out of the box, right? So which means that you now have something that can give you a very good 80, 20 starting point, right? Now, as anybody who have worked on clinical trial matching can tell you, right? Uh, trial actually is not, despite it's easier to study and everything, right? It's not really the bottom, right? So if you have, if you are a farmer, you maybe run at most 100 trial at, at, at the same time, you can just afford to see, uh, structure them at hand, right? The real bottleneck is actually patient records, right? And so here is one, the identified uh, sort of like uh, uh, for cancer patient, each bar is one note, right? One clinical note, right? So the first time I look at it, I almost have a heart attack, right? So like, it's so complex, right? Again, this is common sense for you guys, right? But for layman like me, right? This is a great eye-opening moment. Um, and also it's very frustrating because even some basic information, right? Like, like histology, uh, his, histopathology, kind of like subtyping and so forth, sometimes a single piece of information, you have to combine multiple notes, right? It, and sometimes they separate, like here's a radiology report which give you one piece of information. Three months later, you got a pathology uh, biopsies or something. Now when you combine, okay, now I can finally subtype this thing, right? Um, and so this is a much, much harder challenge. Um, and uh, again, we are pretty fortunate to have very uh, good collaborators uh, uh, and specifically with Providence, we have a, 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 a very productive pro, uh, collaboration. So we start to make some progress, even uh, sort of like in the prior version, prior generation of large language model, right? And now with GPT-4, you can imagine actually we can do even better. Um, and so here is a, actually a demo with uh, the identified data uh, of our clinical time matching system uh, uh, that powered by LM, right? One thing I want to emphasize is that we don't see AI get to 100% anytime soon, right? And so what we actually envision is that AI can do a lot of the legwork for human experts, right? Like AI is very good at navigating a giant system, right? So coming through 30 million paper or 200 nodes is no very, uh, very trivial for an AI system. Um, what you want is the AI actually do all those legwork for you to come up with candidate needle from the haystack, right? So now you just uh, present those uh, candidate needle in a very sort of like easily human verifiable way. So now the, the human expert can just uh, focusing on the more interesting stuff, uh, more challenging reasoning and other things, um, but also they can click a button and so forth to finish uh, curation or, uh, uh, or, or whatever. And so that's how we sort of envision uh, this uh, kind of human computer symbiosis. Um, and so when I start working on the health space, right, one of my biggest nightmares is really like, we work on something and our folks tell, tell us like, it doesn't matter, right? Like we don't care, right? Um, so it's pretty heartening that we start to have some kind of like progress that start get, getting traction, at least someone is using it, right? Um, so Providence, uh, some of you might know, it's a pretty large health system in the West Coast. Um, they start using our research system in, uh, daily in the tumor board, uh, and some of the marquee, you know, high-profile trial like this one, uh, the the adoption is our trial. So the trial PI, uh, Dr. Rom Leonard, described to us at the beginning of the project, right, how painstaking 
uh, for him to scour the notes, right? Like, you know, I mean, this is a highly skilled doctor, right? Uh, spending all this kind of, you know, groundwork in scouring a note to find even a single candidate patient, right? Um, now with our system, uh, he, he pretty much have every candidate at his fingertip. But also, even more excitingly, it's like there was everybody educate us about this dream about just in time clinical trial management, right? So obviously, like you know, the trial keep coming up, trial protocol get updated, patient status get progressed, and so forth, right? Um, right now, a patient would be lucky if they are evaluated even just once during the entire journey, right? But with AI in the loop, you can potentially just keep monitoring 24 percent right? Um, so initially, Ram has this uh, trial that um, he's like, like the target is like 24, right? It's not even a humongous number, um, but for months and months, uh, he got just two, right? Um, now we are very happy to learn very recently, he feel all 24. So very exciting to see sort of like, we started having some impact. Um, but if you think about it, clinical trial matching, obviously is a very important uh, application in its own right, right? But in the grand scale of things, it's really just the beginning, right? So it's really a very good starting point because it naturally reaching delivery and discovery, but the same foundation technology can actually be used to unlock other very similar high value applications, right? So um, for example, like many of you are obviously super familiar with like, the painstaking journey of drug development, right? And one of the reasons of those skyrocketing costs is because of this large scale uh, uh, trial, right? And when you look at uh, a typical RCT, right? And when you think about the control arm, what does it do? It basically try to get the sufficient statistic for standard of care, right? Uh, when you have active control at least, right? Which means that if you can structure population level AMR, you can potentially get those statistics uh, for free, right? And in fact, there are already some pioneer like Flatiron that already show that this is not a pipe dream, right? The only challenge is that they right now they have to hire you know lots of you know abstractor and each patient often can take hours right to pull out some of the basic structure information. Now you can imagine that if we can harness this universal structuring capability for a large length model, right? Then we can potentially make those uh, abstractor or uh, register curator superhuman, right? To curate much, much faster. And by doing that, you now suddenly could potentially unlock lots and lots of scenarios, right? Um, and, and then, um, so, so far we have been talking about text uh, modality, right? But uh, there is actually a lot of exciting growth uh, area in the multimodal, right? So if you ask me what's the biggest growth opportunity for GPT-4 or even GPT-400, right? Uh, which has seen the entire public web, right? I would venture to uh, hypothesize that the biggest multimodal longitudinal kind of patient journey, right? So no matter how many public web quality token that this model consume, it probably wouldn't have seen that many of them, right? So which means that uh, there is a lot of room for growth, which I will show some example later, uh, right? And and finally, I you might have played with ChatGPT and GPT four, right? And you would notice that this thing, it may not be the perfect purveyor of truth. In fact, you shouldn't use it as a source for truth, right? But it's a pretty amazing reason, right? You, if you harness it to reason on your own data, on your trusted documents, on your trusted knowledge graph, it can actually be pretty amazing to actually give you a lot of like potential hypotheses and other thing to actually help you scale your discovery and, 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 and journey, right? So, so like that's sort of like what we think is really the most exciting is like, can we imagine creating co-pilot for every single persona in the health system, right? To make everybody a superhuman, right? To, to actually perform uh, much, much more efficiently. And, and ultimately, uh, obviously that will be uh, really exciting uh, uh, to improve uh, patient care. So I would I would just stop for a second to see if there are any questions and comments. Yeah, there is a question in the chat. Actually, um, okay, let me um, 
help with the chat. Okay. Um, or, you know, maybe we'll, we'll, why don't we do questions in the end just for the oh, logistics? Okay. Um, so, so one thing that um, um, we we think a lot about these days, right, is that um, when you think about this moment, uh, uh, almost a sort of a historical moment, which is that you are not really thinking about GPT-4 as giving you another five points of accuracy or something, right? Uh, what it actually enables you to do is to start thinking about completely different way to approach it, right? So I have talked about the universal structuring, right? So this can totally scale other ways and other practice and so forth. Um, but there are other superpower that the large language model you can start to harness, right? To actually uh, uh, supercharge a lot of things that you do, right? So another superpower is what I would call universal translation, right? So you can literally use it to do translation, right? Um, it's actually do amazing well, right? So there are a lot of specialized uh, 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 kind of like uh, empty machine translation system uh, that GPT-4 actually outperform, right? Um, and you can translate between natural language to SQL, right? So there has been a long-standing field call and natural language interface to the database, right? And this thing out of the box can do very well, right? Um, you can start to also translate among different plugin API, right? That's that's how it started the whole plugin app store moments and all that. But also, it can also translate among different ontologies, right? So you can start to think about okay, OMA, Fire, and so forth. They may not be such a you know. Uh, so that will have major implication about interrupt, right? So in the past, we think about hey. Let's sit down for a couple of years, figure out harmonizations, and you know, uh, make sure everything is the same schema. But now with this translation capability, you maybe get away with getting some initial ROI before you actually invest so heavily in doing the harmonization, right? Um, and and then another thing that um, um, it's it's something I I sort of alluded to earlier uh, during our chat, right? Uh, with some of you is like. When you have a GPT-4 at your hand, you can actually have a virtual army of mechanical Turk and Upwork, uh, not not perfect, but but uh, a very very good uh, uh, sort of like uh, capability to help you evaluate things, annotate things, label things. Again, I will show you some more concrete examples, right? So, but that's actually really a game changer, like. Like uh, I joke about, like my team has always been a free lunch team, right? So we think we work on self supervised learning for a long time, um, but now there is a different scale of self like like free lunch you can get, which is that you can actually build entire benchmark, eighty uh, twenty, right? Starting using large language model, and I will explain a little bit why uh, that can be uh, done. But finally, I think the most amazing thing I would say is this recent capability. Right. So, and uh, one thing uh, that we really see is uh, already quite close at hand is that we can potentially enable everybody with a, a substantial data store, right, to turn it into a discovery engine, right. So to enable you to actually talk to the data in actual literal sense, right. So again, you see some example, and but if you think about it, like people talk about, like in silico you know, uh, hypothesis generation, right, and discoveries and so forth. Um, a lot of these are now much more tangible, right, uh, than, than we have before. And now, obviously, none of this matters if there is no change, right, to uh, patient care, to human needs, right? Um, and, and here I will cite one example that really top of mind for us, but there are many, many examples, and I'm sure you guys uh, also have so many use cases and so forth. But this is one, I think, a very uh, kind of like uh, typical kind of case for real world evidence, right? Which is like, you have this amazing next generation cancer treatment, right? Starting from, you know, in the old days, like slash poison and burn to targeted therapy, right? But now actually everybody believe, okay, we need to harness the immune system to tackle all the variants, the, the mutation and so forth, right? Because the immune system have natural selection, right? But still is frustratingly uh, close and not there yet, right? So you look at some of the marquee blockbuster drug like Chichuda, right? It's saving many lives already, 
but the response rate is only like 40%. Right, why doesn't it work for those 70% of the patients, right? Now, there are already millions of people who have taken this kind of checkpoint inhibitor. If you can gather all those data and then figure out, hey, here's an exception responder, here's a non-responder, can you start to see some differences, right? And then is there any potential hypotheses, right? Uh, that could lead you to better companion diagnosis to say the least, but also maybe even mechanism to improve the treatment efficacy, right? Maybe we pair Kichuda with another targeted therapy or chemo or something, right? Um, and traditionally, this can be very, very tough to do, right? So because the, the sort of the reward data is incredibly fragmented, and certainly one reason, uh, partially from our observation, is that because of all those unstructured data, Right, so um, and and because of that bottleneck, uh, you don't have enough human expert to structure them, and thereby you cannot fulfill the ROI. Right, so it's not worth. So it become a kind of vicious uh, chicken and egg, like negative cycle. Right, like because you can't get ROI, so you don't invest in the infrastructure, so you couldn't get ROI. Right, but I I think what you can think about sort of generative AI, uh, at least we think about it as as certainly is not. Uh, changing everything, but it can serve as sort of a spark, right? As a catalyst, right? It it make the ROI landscape change, right? It make the incentives landscape change, right? So now maybe in the past it's not affordable, but now it become affordable, right? So now there is a reason to make this a much more efficient uh, kind of like a uh, uh, place. And again, can we actually empower everyone like you guys, right? Turn your data store into a discovery engine and, and get all those insights. Um, and so that's a little bit of the high level vision. So let me quickly go through some of the concrete examples. Um, but uh, obviously like uh, first comment is that a lot of people ask us, right? Like uh, what you describe here, right? Isn't that, you know, what people have been doing for ages, right? Which is completely true, right? People have been working on like claim data, structure EMRs and for ages, right? I think one of the really exciting opportunity here is that there are so much more nuances beyond what you can get from the claim data, right? That you can now potentially unlock, right? So there are a gazillion examples, but I will just give you one, right? So a few years ago, we worked with Hutch and, and they want us to help them with uh, developing NLP to extract cancer recurrence. Right. So I was very naive at the time. I asked, so isn't there a perfect ICD code for breast cancer recurrence? Right. Why not using that? Right. And then they educated me that even though there is a code there, uh, often it's not structured. Right. So you still have to go back to the notes. Right. So, so I like to kind of think about that. What we can potentially now do is to unlock some of those dark matters, right. In the unstructured. So suddenly start from text, but also like, you can now also think about the multimodal omics, imaging, and all that, right? Um, now, this is super exciting, um, but can the technology deliver, right? So, um, if you look at like a few years ago, right, and we really think about scaling, 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 right? Now, that trajectory start to slow down a little bit, right? Um, you're not getting a hundred trillion parameter model anytime soon, right? Um, and, but there are so many other exciting growth areas that like, like actually uh, so many research questions that need to be solved. So I will quickly touch on some of these four areas that, that we have been uh, 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 trying to make some uh, contribution. Um, and I will start with the first one, which I discussed with some of you early on, right? So um, there are this uh, new job category called from engineer, right? So, and if you interpret in a narrow sense, right? Uh, I, I mentioned about like, I have this mental model about like Harry Potter stuff, right? Like you figure out the spell, right? And uh, in the early days, there was this crazy thing like, oh, you need to use uh, all caps, right? Almost like a spam email, right? Uh, you need to repeat your instruction for multiple times, right? Uh, there were a bunch of those kind of tricks, right? Uh, and, and, but I think, those are still, uh, some of those are still, you know, uh, necessary, like you still need some witchcraft or 101, right, to, to get by. But I think that actually missed the whole forest, right, which is that the really big deal here is that the programming as we know it might be fundamentally changed, right? So in the past, we need to learn, you know, computer science, we need to learn about different languages, programming, and so forth. 
now you can have high school kids or, or you know, domain expert can go in using natural language. So English or, or Chinese or, or Hindu, right, will be your programming language, right? And also you don't need to limit to a single uh, large language model call, right? You literally can think about the entire programming uh, 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 like that, that the, the LM call is a, a single statement, right? Um, which means that there are everything, every artifact related to programming, the whole ecosystem we need to rethink about, right? What's the new compiler? What's the new IDE, right? What's the new unit test and regression test and so forth, right? Now here, what I want to focus in on one aspect, which is that how do we fundamentally address the accuracy problem, right? Because that's a single biggest problem. It's like, uh, I, I interact with a lot of medical folks and their first question to me is always like, yeah, this thing seems amazing, but it can hallucinate, right? How can I trust it, right? And here is sort of related to one of the hidden superpower, which is what I called earlier, which is that you can actually have LLM be its own fact checker, right? And, and now you may ask me, why would this thing uh, make up error in the first place and then be able to cut that error, right? And the underlying reason is actually very simple. Um, it's, it's because the two paths are fundamentally different, right? So when you're asking it uh, 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 to do a certain task to generate certain output, it's actually tackling a very challenging task, which is like predicting token, token, token. So you are dealing with an exponential search space, right? Um, and, and that's a very, very hard problem to solve, right? Which is why it can hallucinate, it can make all kinds of errors, right? It can have omission error and so forth. But if you are conditioning on a particular utterance, when you're asking it to just verify, right? That's actually a much, much easier problem, right? And when you go back to computer science one one, that's actually just known as P versus MP, right? So there is a symmetry between the search uh, problem and the verification problem, right? And so that's actually something you can harness to actually uh, use LM uh, to, to actually uh, get better, right? So for example, um, let's say if you have a clinical note, right? We want to do some basic stuff, like let's pull out some basic demographic stuff, right? Like gender, age, and and so forth, right? Um, you can have the usual prompt, right? So you don't need to actually read the actual text, but the top one is actually your natural instruction to, to ask it to do uh, uh, extraction, but you can also come up with a verification prompt, right? And then you can basically say, I ask it to do it, uh, the extraction first, but then uh, you ask it to fact check itself, right? Now, so here's a one uh, example of the identified notes, right? Um, and then, uh, as you can, uh, as many of you probably know, uh, LM can be very smart in some aspect, but it sometimes can completely uh, super dumb on simple arithmetic, right? So here it actually got the age wrong. Uh, it should be 76, right? It, it's, uh, it got 16. Yeah. Um, I still don't know how to do it, but when we ask it to verify, it somehow caught the error, right? So, so that shows you sort of like, one very simple example how you can do the verification, but you don't have to stop there, right? So let's consider a slightly more complex, uh, complex problem like problem list identification, right? Imagine you have a distress summary of 20,000 words, right? And you said, hey, give me all the ICD codes and the, the problems and so forth. Uh, you can engineer to death uh, the problem, but I will bet you that it's very hard to get a problem that you get it in, in one shot, right? But you don't have to, right? So what you can do is that, oh, let's figure out some very uh, intuitive prompt to say, give me the disease list, right? Um, but you are not counting on it to be correct in the first shot, right? You said, you write another prompt to say, okay, condition on this disease and this note, right? Tell me why you think uh, there is this disease. Give me a uh, providence, right? And, and then conditioning on the provenance, uh, you can ask it to verify. Tell me whether it's correct, right? You can even do uh, things like, you can say, hey, conditioning on what all the disease you find, right? Uh, can you try to find more disease, right? So which can actually tackle a flip side of hallucination, which is omission, 
right? The recall error, right? Um, so, um, yeah, so here is a, a real example from a really long discharge summary, right? The first shot get you something that reasonably uh, uh, well. Uh, actually, everything in the first shot is correct. Uh, at least GPT thing, uh, 4 thinks so. Um, but then when you ask it, oh, can you find some omission? It can, right? And also even more encouragingly is that you said, hey, give me the provenance. Uh, it actually find a reasonable provenance, right? And also it was able to determine that actually this is incorrect, right? Based on this uh, provenance, right? Um, and then it will basically cross it out, right? And then it will continue. So, so in the next round, you find another case uh, where you actually rule out the uh, endocardesis, right? Um, so during the generation part, it get it wrong, but it's not too wrong, right? But but then during the verification, it was able to actually uh, identify the correct pol polarity and things, like that, right? So. Um, so one very encouraging exercise is that by doing something that very simple like this, um, we can actually, like GPT-4 out of box is not bad, right? It's uh, quite competitive already, but not quite at the level of specialized civilized uh, system. But when you, when you just do some of this uh, simple step, we dramatically cut down on some of the error, right? So uh, again, I'm not claiming that we have a panacea here, um, but this is a very promising approach. Um, and then, um, so, uh, so far we are saying, hey, we're using the model out of box, right? But you can also use it to actually as a noisy teacher, right? So here is a task uh, that is um, uh, given a, a biomedical text, right? Let's uh, pull out what uh, does it say some adverse event, right? So this is obviously an interesting task is in our own right, but well studied, right? Um, I, I bet you're gonna have some paper on this, right? Um, so, and the supervised state of the art uh, is actually obviously doing very good. Now, when you look at GPT-3 and GPT-4, right? Um, they are quite competitive out of box, but, but still there is a big gap. Now, what's interesting is that we do this very simple exercise, right? We have GPT-3 um, and, and actually we, we want to try GPT-4, but at that time, even for us, uh, we don't have uh, API access. Yeah, right. <laughs> so we try GPT-3 as a noisy teacher. Uh, we use it to annotate 30, uh, 50,000 abstracts, right? So it's a good kind of hallucination of the training data. And then we train our favorite uh, baby of comet bird, right? Um, obviously, you guys have done pop bio birds and others, so you can train any, really any bird. Um, and what's actually surprising for us is that initially we hope that this distilled model would be uh, as like matching the GPT-3 performance, right? What we didn't expect is that it actually almost tied the supervised system. And I think that really tied to your question earlier, right? It's like um, there is something, some great growth opportunity to be had in this distillation, right? So, and obviously like when you think about this, it's like um, you have a lot of advantage in distillation, like with cost, with efficiency, with white box access and all that, right? But on the other hand, you probably don't want to distill 20,000 model for 20,000 tasks, right? So, so there is an interesting exercise we are now thinking about, can we find some in the media layer, right? Like, can we distill some model just doing structure, right? Can we do something just doing generation summarization, right? Now, the advantage of doing that is that when you have a more restricted use, right? you don't need to worry about all kinds of other crazy stuff that you normally need to do the alignment, right? When you train a LAMA model, or MPT and so forth, right? Right now you're using ChatGPT or other things to create a very large set of instruction following, try to cover all kinds of alignment, but you spend a lot of bandwidth in dealing with something that you may not care for your special uh, category. So we do think there is a lot of uh, room for, for growth here. Um, so, um, and so now, once we can start to structure a lot of this kind of data, right, then we can start to get closer and closer to turn it, the real world data uh, from the raw material into something go, right? So to a discovery uh, finding, right? Now, obviously, like, you know, you guys uh, know way better than I do, right? So the big, like RCT is not going anywhere soon, right? So, so we still need RCT in some capacity and form because there are confounded, right? Um, but 
we can potentially use a real world observational data to dramatically reduce uh, the cost in the ICT. That's the promise, right? But there are a lot of things that we can actually do uh, to alleviate the confounding, right? So not, not necessarily curing every single confounding uh, effect, but you can alleviate a lot of them, right? So we start to doing a little bit of this exercise where we say, hey, let's try to do some structuring exercise first. Let's try to incorporate some uh, basic probabilistic QC, right? Like imputation, denoising, and so forth, right? Um, then we basically uh, will be able to empower like incorporating the clinical trial matching. So now you can basically create any virtual cohort, right? Like specify any criteria, I can grab you a virtual cohort from the real world data, right? Now, once you have that, you can start to incorporate a lot of state-of-the-art cost of reasoning approach, right, to alleviate the confounder. Um, so what that gives you is now actually uh, what we hope to build is uh, sort of really a turnkey sort of like hypothesis generation and testing engine, right? So, so we, uh, we start to see some promise here. Uh, we, we, we still barely scratch the surface, but here is a bunch of marquee lung cancer trial, right? And on the left-hand side, you can see those are the published uh, uh, HR uh, uh, hazard ratio, right? So those are kind of the statistics you want to get, right? Uh, you, you gain from those uh, running those expensive RCT, right? So here we basically ask the first question, which is like, okay, with our Providence collaborators, right? Uh, with the Providence data, um, if we were to simulate those trials, what kind of statistic will we get, right? So on the right hand side, you will see actually different uh, setting. Uh, when we, uh, if we uh, adhere strictly to the criteria, if we relax some of the criteria and so forth, right? So now you can also see you can potentially uh, 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 think about uh, clinical trial designs and so forth, right? Um, and but ultimately, uh, I certainly see this as just the first baby step. But what's really exciting is that what if we can now turn this into you know uh, figuring out external synthetic control for post-market surveillance for pharmacal uh, vigilance and so forth, right? So 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 that's a really exciting. Um, and finally, I would say that the biggest growth area is actually in multimodal, I would say, right? So, and here's a sort of like a, a motivating example for us, right? So when you think about uh, what goes wrong with those immunotherapies, right? So a lot of the oncologists educated us like, it has to do with tumor microenvironment, right? So how the tumor cell interact with your immune cell give you a lot of signal whether this guy can uh, respond to the immunotherapy, right? And um, so, but some of this signal, you are actually, you will not get it anywhere, uh, not with genomic, not with nodes, right? Unless tomorrow you can scale spatial transcriptomic, maybe you can get some of the comparable signal. But today, the most reliable signal you get is actually from PATH, right? Uh, digital pathology. But even the best pathologists today, looking at this pattern, they may not be able to discern uh, some of those patterns. Right, so so there is a question like, can we empower them? Right, but but obviously you need to uh, do the multimodal stuff. And again, when you think about the GBD4 or GBD400, that's the big growth area as we discussed earlier, right? And um, uh, a few months ago, obviously Meta had this amazing work about SAM, right? So uh, for generic cementation. But when some of us try it uh, on some of the medical setting, uh, obviously. It, it's very easily put down, right? So basically on the right, the rightmost side, that's a ground tool. You want to identify all those cells, right? Um, but SAM, what SAM is very good at is to identify the bigger contour, right? It gives you some very big contour, um, but it doesn't actually catch the, the minor detail, right? So when you look at CT, it's the same thing. It, it gets the anatomy, but, but that's really uninteresting, right? Every CT is almost like that, right? So you want those minor detail, which is, what this uh, general domain uh, segmentation is not uh, specifically good at, right? And then uh, talking about fast progress, right? Within six days, right? Somebody in NVIDIA and uh, Vanderbilt, right, come up with this really nice study to actually quantify what are the growth uh, area, right? So you can see from some of the categories, right? Like you have the SOTA, obviously those are supervised and specialized, right? But uh, the out of the box SAM, 
uh, has a huge gap, right, from those SOTA. So the question then is like, can we uh, develop some medical, more medical competent uh, multimodal system, right? So uh, this is something I uh, uh, tell Ken before, right? So uh, when we try this on some of the pretty state-of-the-art uh, textual generation image uh, generation model, right? You ask it, give me a lung CT scan, uh, it give you a glowing lung, right? So, um, but the, the hope is that um, I basically have one of my team member who basically spend a weekend uh, just grabbing some of the DID public uh, CT scan and you do a little bit of fine tuning and you can already see that, okay, this model is no longer so dumb, right? So, so there is a lot of potential here. So um, specifically at Microsoft, so we have done a several sort of study, right? Um, we obviously like everybody else start with mimic CSR, right? So, um, and uh, the basic idea obviously uh, is very simple, right? You treat them as a translation problem, right? So you have the image, you have the report, right? And you try to force them to go into the same embedding space, right? So that's uh, known as a contrasted learning. I'm sure many of you have done that uh, already, right? Um, that can give you a very good starting point. Um, but may make chest rate, however good the resource is, is just 20, 200K, right? Uh, all ICU, you know, right? So um, all chest rate, right? So, so then we ask, okay, what is the biggest uh, data set? maybe public source, right, that we can pull for biomedical image and text, right? So then uh, we work on PubMed for many years, so then naturally we go to PMC, right? And turns out there is lots of jam there, right? Because you can grab the image, uh, the figure, right? And then you can grab the caption. You can also actually get all the citation, right? So the in, within the paper is that figure four blah, shows blah, 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 right? You can grab all those. So with that, uh, it is a lot of engineering work, uh, uh, hard work done by my team. But uh, what's amazing is now we have this resource, right? Like tens of millions of uh, biomedical image and taxpayer, and they cover immensely diverse uh, range of uh, 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 biomedical uh, stuff, right? So we start to basically do, again, we start from simple, simplest thing first, right? So we say, hey, uh, how is Clip doing versus like Clip? This is a very standard contrasted learning model, right? Uh, training on the general web, right? Um, and obviously, not surprisingly, it doesn't do very well in the biomedical domain. Um, but biomedical Clip actually, by training on the biomedical specific one, uh, we can actually drastically improve it. Um, and then, what's actually surprising to to me personally is that we try to evaluate on a bunch of uh, radiology specific tasks. Right, so these are zero shop image classification. These are radiology, and we have some prior work like what I show you about the 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 mimic CSR work like BioWheel, right? Um, and it actually outperformed the radiology specific model, which we spent a lot of work in trying to make a good radiology language model and and actually tailor to radiology uh, nose uh, structure, like figure out finding versus impression and so forth. And so we still don't fully explain why biomedically actually train on uh, this uh, uh, larger data set actually on this radiology specific outperform it. But our hypothesis is that maybe that diverse training, right, uh, have some help. Um, so uh, this is not fully settled, but but it's pretty sort of like delightful surprise. Um, and then we then go about to think about okay, when we have this resource, right. Uh, can we also go one step closer to have sort of like research copilot, right? So imagining uh, you have uh, some copilot to help you like, hey, here's an image, medical image, uh, have a conversation about it, right? So kind of like ChatGPT, but, but for biomedical images, right? So this is something like, you know, uh, uh, the team actually works super, super hard. Uh, we, we actually, from the initial conception to first paper submission is like three weeks, right? Um, and and so so super baby steps, so caveat, like nothing uh, near to perfection uh, at all. But still, why I want to include here is want to show you how you can harness GPD-4 to do good hallucination, right? So when you think about it, so what you need to train a, a visual research copilot is that you need the training data as follows, right? You need the image, and then you need a sort of like a question or instruction or problem or whatever, and then you need the output, right? So you need a triple, 
you need a triplet. Um, by default, we don't have that triplet, right? We only have the pair of the image and the description. Um, now, the description is very informative, but it doesn't have all those conversational elements, right? Now, what is actually really interesting is that you can actually uh, ask GPT-4 to say, hey, forget about the image, right? Like the GPT-4 version we use here are blind, right? It, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't have the image capability yet, right? Um, but it can parse the description, right? So we said, hey, uh, GPT-4 conditioning on this description conjure up some multi-turn question answer uh, sequence for us. Amazingly, it complied, right? So I'm not saying it actually uh, do a perfect job, right? In fact, there is so much room. We are actually working very actively to improve the quality. Um, but even the 8020 starting point is not too bad, right? Um, so in this way, you basically, starting from the, the, the biomed clip, the, the image and text pair, um, and then using GPT-4, you now actually suddenly you got the data, right? Um, to train this uh, visual research uh, co-pilot. So uh, we, even at Microsoft, and maybe especially at Microsoft, we are very, very crunch on GPU. So we do a hyper-selective uh, uh, on, on some of our initial experiment. Um, so we pick some of this, uh, what we think potentially high value category, but there are so much growth space. Um, so we want to enable a catchy title to change a uh, system within a day. So, so, but actually, honestly, it's because we don't have that much GPU anyway. So, um, and um, but but it's very interesting to see that we can already sort of do some of this. Um, now, all these are sort of in the public domain, right? But they doesn't actually really touch on the patient uh, record, which actually have lots and lots of. Uh, real uh, uh, kind of potential to grow. So uh, working with our Providence uh, collaborator, it, it took us uh, quite a while, right, uh, to get the funding to digitize all their pathology slide of cancer. Um, also, like uh, a few years ago, I naively thought, okay, all these providers have all the radiology images, right? Actually, those images are not in the computer book. <laughs> uh, uh, not, right, so, so it actually, take another calculate effort to pull them out from the legacy packs and so forth. But the good thing is that we finally get to a pretty good, uh, uh, at least a functional multimodal learning space. Um, and one of the really moonshot that really motivate us a lot is again, go back to this kind of real world evidence case, right? So can we learn from the real world evidence to push the cutting edge for drug development for comparing diagnosis and other things, right? So. And, and, and here we at least see some plausible uh, a, a, like reason that the multimodal actually is crucial, right? Um, so uh, obviously we barely scratched the surface yet. We did some sanity track about performance, right? Like correlating uh, pathology slide with omics and so forth. We verified that we can detect certain correlation with certain mutations. So it seems like we are not completely off track. Um, so, but, but there is so much more can be done. Um, I will quickly conclude, right? So one thing that uh, we actually see like is that um, when you, many people ask us like, when you think about multimodal, right? And do you need to start some from scratch, right? And my, my hypothesis is that we definitely don't want to, right? And in fact, there is a, again, a, a symmetry between the text domain and many other modalities, right? And the reason is because in the text domain, uh, some model like GPT-4, right, actually capture lots and lots of like knowledge, right? It actually know every single gene. It has seen every single mention about a gene symbol, uh, every single variant mention, right? Um, it know a lot of those things uh, 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 already, right? So we don't want to throw them away. So one of our approach, uh, uh, this is just a very tiny uh, start, uh, baby step in collaboration with you, Dom, right? Um, but we want to map all those other modality into the GPT-4 space by leveraging some of those uh, bimodal translation pairs, right? So for example, if you have single cell uh, data, right, you can leverage some of the uh, already annotated cell type, right, using that as a bridge, right, to actually uh, map the transcriptome to the, you know, the, the GPT-4 embedding space for those cell type. Now you can generalize to cell that you don't even have a name today, right? Um, so, so that's some of our early baby step exploration, but you can now imagine 
doing that for proteomics or you know uh, 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 um, kind of like uh, uh, methylations and, and and all those other things. So so lots and lots of exciting things, right? So I would just uh, quickly conclude to imagine like. Um, what is the one of the really ex most exciting moonshot that we can do in health LM, right? I, I would argue that would be like, let's start with GPT-101, which we will have already consumed every single political kind of our web, but it still haven't actually seen a whole lot of longitudinal patient records, right? Now, imagining if we can actually do that continuum for training, right? So the obvious thing you would ask is like, can we discover some health-specific scaling goal? Right in multimodal space, right? Um, can we discover some emerging health uh, capability, right? So obviously we are not going tomorrow to say, hey, give me the license to do all this, right? But I think we can do it in a smaller scale, right? And in fact, I think you guys actually are sitting uh, uh, in a particular privileged place to do some of this experiment, right? Um, and and actually a lot of those scaling law, right? If you look at how OpenAI do it, uh, they are not done uh, with GPT-4 upfront, right? You start from GPT, GPT-2, GPT-3, you can already sort of start to uncover some of those scaling law. And I think we can do the similar thing in health. So, uh, so I would just want to quickly acknowledge my team who actually do all the work. Uh, I'm just pushing uh, PowerPoint slide these days. Um, and also all our collaborators, um, and obviously without whom uh, we can't do any of this. So thanks everyone. Let's um, move to a QA and a uh, session. And, uh, great. So first of all, thank you for a fantastic talk. I have this laptop in front of me for the Q&As from online. Um, and uh, let me ask you to just give, give us a, a small explanation about something that you didn't touch on very much in this talk, and that's alignment, right? So these yep. things need to behave well. Yep. And can you give a little um, overview about what that alignment process looks like, for example, so that it doesn't yep. give out answers that are racist or um, you know dangerous yep. and, and in healthcare, the edge cases for danger are so many. I'm so where does the alignment piece kind of fit in? Yeah, um, that's a fantastic question. So um, a lot of eyeball when we when you think about GPT-4, right? A lot of eyeball has been on the pre-training side, right? So um, this guy is being pre-trained on trillion and trillions of web tokens, right? Um, but what hasn't been actually, I, I think many of you are probably already familiar, but there are another two secret sources uh, after pre-training, right? That's uh, what we discussed a little bit beforehand. Uh, one is uh, supervised fine-tuning. That's a very explicit alignment, right? So, so alignment is this concept that it, it originated from the concept about like, hey, AI is amazing, but can we make sure AI do the thing that align with the human value, right? Uh, we don't want AI to go about, you know, you know, uh, um, doing things that we don't like, right? So that's the origin of the concept of the alignment. But when you boil down to execution, as you asked about, right, it's pretty much like showing to some extent this model, like, hey, given this kind of pattern, don't do this kind of thing, or maybe do this kind of thing, right? So, so it it's boiled down to as simple as something like that. Uh, now, one thing that is pretty amazing from the pre-training step is that by doing the pre-training, by pre-training on those that much uh, information, right? Uh, the model already accomplished a very effective uh, dimension reduction or people call information compression or what have you, right? Which means that it doesn't need that many examples to steer the behavior, right? Uh, for this kind of model. So, that is what goes on in the supervised fine tuning is like, okay, first thing you want to cause some of this, like what you mentioned about the racist uh, output or some of the, you know, like, uh, you, you know, engaging in some dangerous uh, conversation, right? Or, or or harmful to society and those kind of things. Uh, you can think about them to some extent. And first order approximation is like you provide a language model 
with some high level patterns, right? If you saw this kind of pattern, you know, go to that, you know, hand response or something, right? Um, I would say that I would add one sidebar to that is that um, many people can, uh, even Peter and Zach mentioned in their book, right? Like um, when you do many of this alignment, you put on more and more straight jacket on the model. And sometimes you constrain the way that the model will answer more creatively. Right, so so there are actually uh, some answer that would actually appear more intelligent, more interesting. Uh, uh, so, for example, when I use the Bing chat these days, I always click the more creative uh, version, right? So uh, because the default uh, one actually sometimes uh, give me too boring answer, right? So so, uh, but back to your question, right? The crux of the matter for help, I think, is that. Um, if we can actually isolate uh, more restricted use case, right? So for example, um, if I'm not using this as an arbitrary chatbot, if I'm just using this to structure uh, patient information, right? Then you may not need to worry that much about the racist output or some of the other dangers, right? But you need to put some guardrail in some other form, right? But, but so that's one way I think uh, would be very useful is like instead of using it in a very free form way uh, in the chat interface, you can also you can do it in many many different ways, right? But one way you can actually literally do it is in the prompt. You can set you only can output a yes or no question, right? Then you don't need to worry too much about alignment to actually prevent all those uh, um, kind of like uh, undesirable outputs. Right? So, could could you imagine an alignment? whereby if someone describes an extremely flawed analytic approach to a natural language interface, to SQL, to oh, a database, absolutely. then yeah. it might be willing to answer it because that might be what the person intends, but also yeah. point out yeah. that this approach is flawed. Is that yeah. the kind of alignment that gets discussed as well? Um, absolutely. So, so the way, uh, in fact, I just come from DIA and we talk a lot about, you know, how to prevent like biases in the training data, transparency and all those kind of thing, right? Um, I think it's actually very useful for this kind of discussion to differentiate uh, what are you using this thing for, right? So uh, you can, again, use it in some more, much more restrictive way. Uh, I would say in those cases, actually, uh, it's much easier to figure out sort of like how you can steer it to do something useful, right? Like for example, uh, if you use it to facilitate a natural language interface to database, um, you can use it in one way, which is like end-to-end, -end, right? You can use it in an automated way, maybe even hook up to some other decision support and so forth. I would argue that at this stage, that would be very dangerous, right? Um, so, but if we can have somewhere uh, some sort of human in the loop in the process, right? You can just treat the language model output as the initial candidate. Uh, that is something that, so I would maybe invest in like maybe even equal or maybe even more thought into that kind of breakdown of formulation than also the alignment, right? So, so I think both of them can accomplish some of the goal and the, the alignment, the challenge, uh, as in any of the multitask learning we discussed earlier, is that uh, it's not a completely free lunch, right? When you do alignment, you do take away some of the capability, right? So, so, um, so how can you not uh, detract from some of those core capability, but you, you can potentially put in some other safeguard that, that's uh, another very active approach. Thank you. Let me ask a very specific question from the chat, and then we'll go uh, into the room. So uh, this is from Danielle Bitterman, who's a radiation oncologist and diplomatics uh, researcher. Um, can you explain, this is very specific, can you explain what is meant by patient level supervision mentioned in the uncle bird study? Yeah. Um, so uh, first of all, thanks for reading our paper. <laughs> uh, so I want to, Give a big shout out to both of my team and also our Providence uh, collaborators, right? So, um, so basically, um, we when we uh, 
work with our collaborator, right? So we don't go about and say, hey, there are all this amazing thing in multimodal or another thing, right? So we start with something that actually immediately touch uh, some of their pain points, right? And one of the pain points they educated me about is actually that uh, in the US, I'm sure you guys are super familiar, right? Like cancer is a reproductive disease, right? And so then you have this requirement that you need to curate uh, basic cancer information to sub submit to the state registry, right? And that can be a very labor intensive uh, uh, effort for cancer providers. Um, and so in the past, there has been a lot of actually amazing works uh, already that people, for example, annotating uh, like thousands of nodes, right? Like pathology reports or something to say, hey, here's the grace, here's the uh, 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 tumor size, something. Um, but there are inherent sort of like challenges to generalize those approach because like they are they are not kind of the natural kind of supervision signal you will get, right? So what we are trying to uh, actually do in that particular case is the following: is that we observe that you do have a lot of this legacy. Uh, uh, cancer registry data, right? But they are patient level, right? They don't tell you which node this thing come from, right? In fact, some of those information may actually come from multiple nodes, as I explained earlier, right? Uh, some of them may be repeated multiple times. Some of them actually you need to synergize, uh, synthesize multiple nodes, right? So there is not a very uh, uh, salient uh, 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 information. So that makes the supervision much harder to utilize. Um, but but on the other hand, it's the most natural sort of relaunch uh, uh, supervision thing that we can get because they have to do it by hand in the past, and thereby they have this legacy registry. So that's what I mean by uh, sort of patient level supervision because uh, you only know that okay, Joe has this tumor side, this histology, but Joe has two hundred nodes. We don't know where they coming from. So one of the uh, contribution we consider we made compared to some of the really amazing prior work is like, we try to go beyond like assuming you have to have no specific or even sentence specific supervision to go to this patient's. Yeah. We're gonna ask a question and I'm gonna repeat it into the microphone. Yes, and it's a clarification, but it's more, yeah. So, so in the sand of that, because we have smaller projects, the question is a patient has, especially in cancer patient, thousands of nodes. Yeah. All these models, they have max length. Yeah. So how do you chunk? Perfect. How do you summarize and couple them? That's yeah. Daniel's question. It's yeah. very technical. Very, very, I'm glad you asked. Let's repeat the question. Oh, yeah. So uh, just repeat the fantastic question back again, uh, which is like, um, all these patients can have hundreds, if not thousands of them, right? Thousands. And, and uh, any, like, and for any, like every, right now we are dominated by transformer, right? And transformer using self-attention, which is a technical mechanism, right? It's very, very powerful, but uh, unfortunately it will grow uh, in a quadratic cost when in the lab, right? So, which means that if you <laughs> trivially throw tens of thousands of tokens to, to it, it will immediately implode, right? Um, so how do we deal with it? Um, and I'm so glad you asked that because that's another, have a contribution we try to make is that we basically try to combine uh, three different things. We start with, uh, at that time, there was no GPT-4 and other things yet. So, so we start with the domain specific for training, like specifically apartment birds and uncle birds and other. Um, and then we also combine with a recurrent neural network, right? It's specifically a GRU, but initially, actually, it doesn't work very well either, right? So GRU as Many of you know, right, uh, RNN in general, when the sequence length is, like GRU specifically, the gated is trying to tackle the gradient diffusion problem, right? But still, when you have very, very long nodes, right, it still can go horribly wrong. So we also incorporate another uh, well-known technique uh, called hierarchical attention mechanism, right? So basically intuition is that there are the natural unit of the nodes, right? So you can basically view your hierarchy like nodes and then the chunks, right? And then the sentences and so forth. Um, so combining all three of them, uh, we start to be able to actually get reasonable results. But, but that, that's a great question. Hi, right, thanks for that great talk. Uh, my question is kind of a two-part question about using GPT-4 to assess GPT-4. 
Uh, so I guess like the first thing that comes to mind is who watches the watch, right? Like, who, who, who watches the watch? Like, <laughs> yeah. You're using GPT for to verify yes. your output. How do you know that the verification is accurate? Yeah. Yeah. Do you need another GPT for to verify that? Um, People have done that. <laughs> it's a, a three levels, right? Yeah. Um, and is that better than, you know, I mean, is it worth introducing yeah. that noise versus having actually like a so, procedural? So there are two two points I want to make. One is I want to echo what I mentioned in the talk, which is that there is a fundamental asymmetry between the generation and the verification. So verification is fundamentally easier than the generation. So there is one reason why the watchman can do a better job in watching rather than right, like actually doing the work, right? So when you're sitting there watching other people do stuff, it's easier to make criticism, right? But but when you actually do it, it's much harder. So first of all, there is that, uh, but I think you raise a very, very good point, which is that can GPT-4 doing, like even imagine you have infinite budget, right? You can do it like, like some, uh, some, some folks that uh, uh, do it in like, you know, call for the API call, right? For a single one to do majority works, right? Uh, you can do it many, many loops, right? But even if you do all of that, you can't guarantee it's 100% accurate. That's actually what I try to emphasize, is that I'm not counting on whatever way you do the safeguarding, uh, it can get to 100% accurate. So I will argue for a long, long time, actually what we should shoot for is the human computer symbiosis, right? So human in a loop, and what we want to emphasize uh, equally is that can LLM give you good explanation, right? Can, can it, like, for example, let me give you one example, right? Um, uh, these days I use the Edge browser a lot, right? Because it has one capability like, okay, here's a PDF, summarize for, right? But imagining you ask a human to say, okay, check, uh, especially check omission error, right? Did I miss something, right? Now, this could be live or that when you're doing distrust summary, for example, right? Um, but it doesn't very, it's not very helpful if you ask a human to say, go read that 20 page thing and compare it with your summary, right? Then I would just do it myself, right? So I think there is a lot of growth space here is that how can you uh, ask LM to do the explanation, not just a very generic explanation, right? It has to be very localized, have very easy, uh, for human to worry about, right? It has to give you very localized provenance so that it makes it like just snap up a finger to verify, right? If we if you can do that, then actually that's what AI can buy you a lot of uh, time, uh, efficiency gain, right? Because it do 99% of the work, you just go in to just fix a few things. Can I ask a follow up? Specific thing. So this will be the last question. <laughs> uh, okay, someone else should go. All right, Mark. No, I'll, I'll let us follow up. Okay, uh, it's just practically when you are using GPT-4 for verification, are you throwing that back to the generating GPT-4 as a new prompt? Is that how it's being? Yeah, very, very good question. So you might, it's very very sharp question, right? So you 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 may initially buy what I said, like verification is easier. But then when you think about it, isn't the verification also a generation problem, right? But still, there is a big difference because the way you structure the problem, right? And for most of the time, GPT four is a very good listener. It will follow your instruction, right? So when you say, "Hey, only output yes or no," uh, when you say annotate it with a, a sentence number or something, it will actually do the same. Right, it will do what you asked about. And specifically, like some of the example I show, right? I can tell you expressly what my hypothesis, why you can do it very well. It's because when you do language model, right? This is not even have anything to do with large language, right? When you do old boring HMM or Ngram or whatever language model, right? One thing that they're doing very, very well about is entailment, right? So it's actually very good at matching this arbitrary Alterance with another alterance, say what's the relationship in it, right? So you can all, all already see like why it can actually do some of the verification uh, or generating a rationale well, right? And so when you ask it to do that much more constrained thing rather than saying, give me the answer, right? Then it will do it in a much more constrained way. 
And when they do a much more constrained task, it's uh, easier. But but you are totally right. Theoretically, it can still go horrible or wrong, right? But but in practice, it it it, it almost behaves like you just it, it's just doing the verification itself. So uh, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic talk. Let's have a round of applause. Back join us and for those people who have come and joined us in person which i encourage folks on the zoom to do next time um, we have a reception here and if you stop sharing for one second we'll just uh, wrap up the webinar which uh, jb will change the the uh, screen <laughs> yeah here's what I can see. just for the final upcoming events yeah. Great. Right. All right. So uh, thank you all for joining. And I want to remind people where uh, we may schedule things over the summer. So check your email. Um, but we definitely kick back up the Landmark Ideas series this fall with um, Bob Langer who's um, uh, is actually the most cited engineer in history at MIT. Uh, Ian Lipkin is a uh, renowned virus hunter. Uh, Rick Burke, who is the founding editor of STAT, um, at, uh, an extremely uh, successful news publication out of the Boston Globe uh, for health. Uh, Tom Mayer, who uh, actually gave a, a truly fascinating talk on the NFL Players Association health activities. Um, it's a microcosm of the health system uh, that is absolutely, absolutely amazing at what he and his team have achieved in terms of player safety over an eight year period. Um, tr tremendously inspiring. Molly, Molly Ann Brody, who you may not have heard of, but you know her work um, because whenever there's a poll cited uh, about health in the news, it's often from the Kaiser Family Foundation and it's Molly Ann's work. Um, Toby Cosgrove, who is a storied uh, CEO, former CEO of uh, Cleveland Clinic, um, and Christina Farr, uh, former CNBC health reporter who really created the health tech beat um, in the news um, and is now uh, an investor. So uh, uh, chip.org slash events uh, to register. And uh, next slide. And uh, please uh, reach out, uh, come visit us uh, in person. Uh, visit the website, chip.org, um, and uh, keep your eye out uh, for uh, postdoc positions and uh, faculty positions that we have here. So thank you very much. <laughs>